This video is supported by Brilliant.org. All my life, I wanted to be a filmmaker. From the time I was a little kid, I wrote my first screenplay at 15 years old, I had to teach myself how to do it. I knew I was destined to be the next Spielberg. And sure enough, today, I'm a YouTuber. A YouTuber. In 2004, I went to Los Angeles for the first time, the epicenter of the movie industry where all the magic happens. And the first place that I went was the La Brea Tar Pits. Because I've always been fascinated by the La Brea Tar Pits. I mean, the whole idea that, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, there was this death trap where thousands of animals got stuck and then flash forward to the 1900s and they find all these now long extinct animals that look like, you know, versions of our animals that like grew up on another planet. I mean, the whole thing is just, it's, it's nuts. Plus that time period of Earth's history where those animals came from has always been fascinating to me because it was like after the dinosaurs and the mammals kind of came into their own and then they sort of became dinosaurs with this whole megafauna thing of giant sloths and saber-toothed tigers and mastodons. It's just, it's just a really interesting period of Earth's history to me. Perhaps the fact that the first place I went when I went to LA was a paleontological, you know, excavation site probably, you know, predicted that I would be a science communicator someday. The point is, a lot of really cool animals have gone extinct over the years. In fact, 99% of all species have gone extinct at some point. But what if we could bring them back? Human beings own this planet. We own it in a way that no other life form has ever owned it in the history of life on this planet. In fact, we're owning it so hard, we're almost making it impossible to live on. So we're almost owning ourselves. Take that, humans. Dinosaurs were impressive, don't get me wrong. I mean, not only in their size, but they lasted for millions of years longer than we'd been around. Same thing for the, you know, giant mammals that came later that I was just talking about, just absolute units. They don't call them megafauna to be cute. But as much of an impact that they've had, we've had much more of an impact on our planet in far less time. Humans were the first terrestrial species to flip the equation. Instead of being shaped by the environment, we're shaping the environment to fit us. Ecologically speaking, we're a pretty big deal, but that big deal has come at a big price. According to a United Nations estimate, we're on track to actually extinct over a million different species. That is an estimate, but it's probably not an exaggeration. According to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, more than a quarter of the 98,500 species that we've methodically assessed are under serious threat. Obviously, some of that is due to natural processes, but the current rate is considered to be from 100 to 10,000 times more than normal. Five mass extinction events have known to have occurred since prehistoric times. We are now living through a sixth extinction event, only this time, it's our fault. Overhunting, loss of habitat, and climate change have claimed many victims, and they're gonna claim many more. And once a species is gone, it's gone. Extinction is forever. At least it always has been. And before I get into why, just really quickly, I'm gonna plug my t-shirts really quick. I always plug it at the end of the videos and still I always get comments in my videos saying, where do I get that shirt? Well, I always talk about it at the end. I'm gonna plug it right now. If you like this shirt or any of the cool shirts that we have available that are kind of fun and nerdy, you can go to answersofjoe.com slash shirts. There, I said it. Go get it, hope you enjoy it, sorry. Since we cloned Dolly the Sheep in 1996, dinosaur fans have been clamoring for a time when a T-Rex might break out of a paddock. But short of a miracle, that's probably not gonna happen. DNA just degrades too much over time, even if it is trapped in a mosquito, trapped in amber. But there are plenty of post-dino species that we do have recent DNA for, including some species that we've made extinct. And there are active efforts to clone these creatures in the same way that we did Dolly. In fact, some people have already done it. An endangered Bantang, which is a type of wild cattle, was actually cloned in 2003, and a Pyrenean Ibex, which is now extinct, was created using a goat as a surrogate mother. Yay, right? Actually, the cloned Bantang only lived half the lifespan of a normal animal. Oh. And the Ibex had breathing problems and only lasted a few minutes. Oh, no. So there's still some work to be done. In the meantime, there are banks of genetic material just waiting for the problems to be ironed out. The technical problems will surely overcome, but there still are a lot of ethical issues around this. You know the line. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. A lot of the issues basically boil down to what's next. There is a danger that restoring extinct species will put pressure on species that have filled the ecological niche that the previous species had filled once before. There are already too many domestic animals in the world. Do we need more wild ones? It's also been argued that it's far better to put resources into conservation than fringe science. 
it's far cheaper, in theory, to protect one black rhino in the wild than to clone one and create a new one. Of course, one bullet from a poacher might change that equation. Like everything else, uh, there's debate on both sides, but de-extinction technologies are currently progressing really quickly. In fact, 2019 has already been a banner year for mammoth de-extinction. So let's take a look at that breakthrough and look at some of the technologies that might bring some other species back from the void. What you're watching is what happened when Japanese scientists merged cellular material from a 28,000 year old woolly mammoth into an egg cell from a mouse. And they did the same with elephant cellular material, which you can see for comparison. In a paper published in March 2019, these scientists said that they observed partial nuclear formation in the cells. They also said that damage to the mammoth DNA was about the same as they would expect to see in a frozen mouse sperm. These guys clearly need a hobby, but the takeaway here is that we're getting closer than ever to seeing a woolly mammoth live again living on this planet. But why would we do that? I mean, the mammoths died out long before our present age, although our human ancestors may have played a part in reducing their numbers, I guess, you know, humans gonna human. Well, it turns out mammoths may have a role to play in climate change. Environmental scientist and ponytail enthusiast Sergey Zimov actually thinks that something like woolly mammoths could actually help prevent the Arctic from warming up faster. For over 20 years, Zimov and his family have been building a nature preserve in the far north of Russia that they call Pleistocene Park. Like pretty much everything in that part of the world, the park is built over a deep layer of frozen soil known as permafrost. And permafrost sequesters large numbers of microbes that if they were to thaw, would release a lot of methane into the air, which would contribute to global warming. It's kind of a major concern. So we are sitting on an enormously big carbon bomb. In fact, Sergey and a lot of other scientists think that the thawing of permafrost is something of a ticking time bomb for the planet. So anything that can keep that from happening is worth a shot. Now, as we all know, darker materials absorb more sunlight than lighter materials. So anything that's white is gonna reflect more sunlight than it absorbs. Uh, anything that's darker is gonna become warmer. This is known as the albedo effect. Now, snow reflects a lot of light, but any kind of brush or foliage that sticks out through that snow will absorb a lot of heat. That heat will transfer down into the ground, which will melt snow, which will reveal soil, which is darker, which will absorb more sunlight, which will heat up more, melt more snow, it goes on and on. And back in the Ice Age, large herbivores like mammoths used to eat this foliage, which kept it from absorbing heat, kept the snow on the ground, which reflected more light, kept everything cold. And without massive eaters like the mammoths around, more brush has been able to come through and that's helped to warm up the Arctic a little bit. Zimov wants to change that. So far he's employed reindeer and elk and bison to graze and clear the brush, but what he really wants is about 50,000 roving elephants walking around clearing all that out. Roving elephants that are of course, you know, uh, adapted for northern climates, also known as a mammoth. And that's exactly what the team in Japan want to deliver. But what they create isn't gonna be exactly a duplicate of a mammoth, not at first anyway. Because the first few mammoths born would actually have to gestate in elephant wombs or artificial wombs. And as we've learned over the years, DNA actually isn't the end all be all of what creates an animal. The environment actually plays a much larger role than we thought. This is actually something doctors are still struggling to understand about human pregnancy. Surrogate pregnancies are, of course, when a couple can't naturally conceive, they do in vitro fertilization and then implant that into a third person, a surrogate mother. And we used to think that the surrogate mother just was basically a vessel that carried the baby, that she didn't share any genetic material with the baby in any way, shape, or form. Now we know it's more complicated than that. It turns out the mother's RNA actually does interact with the DNA of the fetus. Uh, the RNA actually decodes the DNA of the embryo and it actually can turn some genes on and turn some genes off. And this isn't just something that affects the fetus in the womb. This is actually the RNA that passes on to a person continues to affect their development all the way up through adulthood. And this is just one more way that your mom has of controlling you all your life. What this means is that when scientists perform a surrogacy across different species, what they get is effectively a hybrid. Harvard professor George Church, who is the leading geneticist, has been working for years to try to create a hybrid elephant mammoth that he calls a mammophant. And this would actually achieve some of the things that Sergey Zimov wants to achieve. And there are other techniques that can be used to bring back extinct species, but they all have their own hurdles. Multiple initiatives are attempting to revive the aurochs, which is a large cattle species, through selective breeding of its mixed species descendants. And other programs aim to engineer a currently living species into an extinct species piece by piece. None of these methods are ever going to fully restore what was lost. That time has passed. The world has moved on. The arrow of extinction only goes in one direction. But we might get some version of what we've lost. 
Something else to consider is that if that extinction happened a long time ago, whatever niche in the environment that that species filled has long been filled by now. And in fact, that entire environment might not exist anymore. So what then? You have to also consider the role of community in the animal kingdom. You know, not every single behavior in an animal is instinctual. Some of them have to be passed on from one generation to another. So a sole member of a revived species would have to learn that from someone. Who, what are the, how? And this is a concern in another high-profile de-extinction program, which is the Great Passenger Pigeon Comeback. Passenger pigeons used to literally darken the skies. They traveled in literal billions. Literally. Not something you'd want to stand under. So we used to hunt them because, I mean, how could you not? Just fire a gun indiscriminately in the air and five pigeons would fall. And I'm not gonna stop firing my gun in the air indiscriminately or anything. <laughs> Back then, the thought that we could overhunt passenger pigeons was just a laughable concept. Until we did it. We actually hunted them to extinction. But so what, you may be asking. I see pigeons in the park all the time. Yes, you see those all the time. But what you don't see is pigeons that migrate in flocks so big it took days to pass overhead. That much travel of that many animals had a big effect on the heartland in the eastern United States. The bugs they ate, the droppings they left behind, the gaps they created in the canopies when they sat on the branches, and even the entire trees that they would knock over with their weight, all of this helped to boost the natural regrowth cycle of the forest and help keep them healthy. Many ecologists say that the lack of pigeons have made the forest more fragile and less biodiverse, not to mention thicker, healthier forests would sequester more CO2 out of the atmosphere. For all those reasons, our buddy George Church thinks that it's actually a good idea to bring back the passenger pigeons, and he's not alone. Several top geneticists are working on programs to engineer passenger pigeon traits into currently living pigeons. A 2017 project led by Ben Novak actually produced germline chimeras from rock pigeons. What's a germline chimera? In this case, it's a bird that naturally expresses a Cas9 gene in its reproductive system. This enables efficient CRISPR-Cas9 editing, setting the stage for Novak and his team to introduce the reconstituted passenger pigeon traits. Only two entire passenger pigeon genomes have been sequenced, and 37 have been partially sequenced. For a species that once had billions of these things flying around, the question of genetic diversity becomes an issue. Some have argued that they might not be able to breed fast enough to survive the onslaught of modern germs that their bodies are not prepared for, so the idea of uh, gradual hybridizing might be a better way of going about it. You know, this way it would allow for some necessary adaptations from the living species to take place. But back to the question of community and learning in a species. We don't know how much of their migration patterns was inherited, just instinctual, and how much of it was passed on from generation to generation. Even if we create perfect passenger pigeons, will they behave like passenger pigeons back in the day, or will they behave like the rock pigeons that they were created from? Not to mention there was a reason that we hunted the hell out of them back in the day. Passenger pigeons kind of sucked. They were considered a nuisance to people back in the day, and they were a menace to farm crops. I mean, bringing them back might just be inflicting a biblical plague onto ourselves. Now, before you flame me in the comments for being anti-passenger pigeon, I think it'd be really cool to bring them back. I would just make sure and, you know, cover my car. And if we do perfect the extinction, there's a long list of cool animals that we could bring back. And scientists are already working on some of these, most of which became extinct due to habitat loss. Some because of us, some not. The bottom line is, the more our way of life crowds out species around the world, the more effort we'll have to spend on maintaining biodiversity. Humans do definitely own planet Earth. But we haven't been the best owners, let's be honest about it. But maybe now that we've reached a technological point where we're not always fighting for our survival, that's something that we can now think about. Or, hey, why stop with animals? Why not, why not people? You know, why, could we clone Einstein? Could we bring him back? I mean, not him, literally. Obviously, environmental factors play a large part of it. It would be more of a version of him than what actually existed before. But he did have a very remarkable brain. There were unique characteristics about Einstein that gave him an advantage intellectually over other people. You know, what could Einstein do today with modern technology? Maybe he could work out time travel. Then we could just go grab whatever species we want and bring them back, no cloning needed. Still, you don't want to be stupid about it. And if you don't want to be stupid, maybe check out Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is an online learning platform that will teach you to think like a scientist by using your natural problem-solving skills to discover fundamental science and math concepts. You can start yourself off easy with the science essentials and mathematical fundamentals, courses and give yourself a nice little baseline, or if you're a big smarty McSmartface, you can jump straight to vector calculus. 
that's up to you. They also have a daily challenges feature, so if you only have a few minutes a day, you can go in, pop in, do a little problem solving thing, give your brain a little workout, and then get on with your day. Viewers of this channel can sign up for free at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe and you can get free access to their weekly brain teasers and puzzles, a little fun thing to play with there. And uh, the first 200 people that sign up for their premium uh, service that gives you access to all of their courses, get 20% off your subscription for life. I talk about Brilliant all the time because they're awesome. So if you haven't had a chance to go check it out, please go check it out. Brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Link is down in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video and a huge shout out to my answer files on Patreon that are building a community, doing cool things, and just uh, being generally awesome people. Uh, I gotta call out a few people real quick and let me murder their names. We got Alex Purvis, Christoph, Richard Saxon, Christian Nelson, Eric Nye, Robert Kalinge, uh, Rick Malore, Cole Blitz, Billy Dexheimer, Ron Cooper, Terry Bowdler, who is a super answer file, uh, Ken Bushbaum, Jacko Hall, Luis Onsuarez, uh, Matt Miser, Pedro Matos, and Larry Hewitt. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, behind the scenes stuff, uh, live streams that are exclusive to Patreon supporters, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this one. Google thinks you'll like that or any of the others with my face on them. I talk about cool, fun, and science stuff every Monday and Thursday. And if you subscribe, you'll be one of the first people to see them and hit the little bell because apparently you gotta hit the bell these days. All right, I'll leave it at that. Thanks again for watching. You guys go out, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.